Okay, here we go. Let me think now. Okay, if I remember right, I bought the car in August of 77. When I bought the car, it had the original paint. Of course, the interior was original. Um, everything on the car that you see on there now basically was there, except it looked a little more grungy. Um, the, the paint has always been that color blue. Um, I took the car and put it up on blocks, and for the next couple of months, my husband-to-be and I worked on the car. We took everything out of the front end, uh, an example, tie rods, ball joints, things like that, and replaced them. The only things that did not get replaced were the springs. And the reason for that was we never could find the right springs to go back in the car. By the way, if you hear me saying a lot of ums and uhs in between, it's because I'm really trying to think here. We really didn't get very much done with the car back in New York. You know, I told you that, that I originally purchased the car on Staten Island, and the person that I bought it from, uh, his name is Bob Henry, he bought it from a fellow whose name is... James Campbell. The best that I could figure from what Bob Henry told me, James Campbell was a, a black fellow who probably liked to drag race the car, you know, street race it. And that's probably why it had dump tubes on it and a lot of decaling. Now, Rob Henry told me that when he purchased the car, that it had bullseyes on the headlights and spider webs on the rear view mirrors and uh, fake bullet holes, you know, on the, on the glass. So if that's any indication of the caliber of the person that owned it, you know, you can figure that out for yourself. In any event, the car was, was driven hard, I would think, just by the way the clutch was acting. The, the clutch was, was okay, and unfortunately, further on down the line, we, we did wind up changing it. But up until that point, you know, once I had purchased it and moved it onto the Coast Guard base to start rebuilding it, uh, we didn't do any driving. It just it went up on the blocks, and that's where it stayed. Rob Henry turned out to be sort of a slimy type guy. His brother, I understand, was a mechanic for Hell's Angels of New York, and that type of personality just ran within the family. Rob was originally going to rebuild this, the Blue Shelby, as, we, as he called it, being that he also had another 69, which was red. It was a convertible. And then I guess it got too expensive to put parts into the red one, so he decided that he was going to strip the blue one and use the parts into the red one, which he had later turned into a uh, drag racer. But I guess uh, he sort of decided he was going to get married, and then later on said, well, the car is worth too much intact, in so I think I'll sell it. And that's how I sort of came about buying the car. There it was sitting on this roadway off of Staten Island, and my first glance at it was, you know, my impression was that it was a Mustang. And as I passed by and I recognized the hood scoop, I said, gosh, you know, that's not, that's not a regular Mustang. It must be something different. So I backed up and took a look at it, and sure enough, bingo, it was a Shelby. And so we negotiated, and I bought the car for $2,300 and pretty much thought I was getting a good deal. Little did I know that later on I was going to have to put so much money into the car and then only to sell it and break even. But it was an experience, and if I had to do it again, yeah, I probably would. You know, anything to own a Shelby. Anyway, moving right along. So, again, we didn't do very much while the car was on Staten Island, uh, you know, except to get it out there, and we towed it to the Coast Guard base in Brooklyn, which is where my, my husband was stationed. We did some work on the car, and uh, I decided I was going to leave and move out to Colorado. Now, now, Matt and I were not married at the time, but I'm just going to keep referring to him as my husband. Uh, let's see. We, well, I moved to, to Boulder, and six months later, Matt got out of the service. He asked me if I wanted the car in Colorado. Well, naturally, I said yes. So he hitched it up to a 
a tow and uh, pull, pulled it behind his van. Unfortunately, as he was going through Tennessee, the rear tire on the passenger side kicked off, or however you want to say it. It sheared the lug bolts. The tire crashed up into the quarter panel and then proceeded to bounce on down the highway. So naturally, the car was disabled in Tennessee. Matt left the car at a service station, went on down to Florida to where his parents were, got his dad, who fortunately is a mechanic. They drove back to Tennessee and miraculously got the Shelby running. Now, the car had not been running for about a year. You know, it was put up on blocks, and we started working on it, and it just never started it up again. So they got it running, and from that point on, Matt drove it from Tennessee down to Florida. I then proceeded to get a truck driver from Colorado, gave him 100 bucks under the table. He went through Florida and picked the car up. They drove it into the back of his 18-wheeler. And that is when the clutch finally went out. So the car comes into Colorado. The clutch, there's no clutch. It's completely burned. We get it to the apartment that I'm staying at. And within a couple of months after that, I believe we replaced the clutch. Now, I didn't do very much work on it while I lived in Boulder. It, it sat out in the parking lot. I would, I would get notes on it every other week asking to sell it. Please sell it, please sell it. And I just said, no, I wouldn't sell it. I never, never answered any of them. But we did manage to do a little bit of work on the car as far as cleaning up the interior and you know making sure that it ran, which it did. We also put a starter in the car, rebuilt, of course. Um, I should mention that while the car was back in New York, uh, we, we replaced the brakes. Okay, and that meant uh, changing the rotors. We also replaced the calipers. We replaced all the hosing for the brake lines. We replaced the metal brake line, the metal tubing that goes up to the master cylinder. And if you don't think that's a hard job, you ask somebody else that's done it. It's a bitch. But I don't know if that was the reason why the brakes are so touchy to this day, but. I have never driven a car that stops on the dime like the way that car does. So I don't know. You know, you might ask some other people as to why it does that. Anyway, when we change the clutch, we change the pilot bearing, throw out bearing, the flywheel was turned. Uh, it was turned down 10 thousandths, if I remember right. And of course, the, the pressure plate was, was rebuilt. And the clutch disc that was new. And we really didn't do too much else until we finally got married in May of 70, or June of 79, and then we moved up to Longmont. Now the car came up to Longmont and basically it was put in the garage. Matt was sort of tired of working on it. Of course, I didn't have any more money to put into the car. I, you know, with all the, these little piddly things that we had put into the car, I must have had, oh, maybe close to $3,500, you know, in it if not more. I, I really can't remember, to tell you the truth. Now, up until that time, I had only driven the car once or twice, and it was basically to get it running and move it around, you know, from one side of the house to the other. It never was, was really roadworthy, and it was due to the fact that, you know, the tires that were on there were all mismatched sizes. It was basically just tires just to, you know, to get it rolling from one place to the other. The car didn't need that much then, uh, except for you know maybe detailing out the motor and then having it painted. And well, the exhaust system was pretty trash on it too, but we sort of you know counted that into having it fixed up. Certain things on the car, like the horn, never worked. And the reason why the horn doesn't work is because it's in the steering wheel, and the rubber has gotten so hard from years of sitting that it is it just you know the contacts not being made as far as i know the only way to repair that unfortunately is to replace the steering wheel i don't think that anybody has made a kit to replace that rubber band 
Now, this was a year or two years ago. You might check now. Maybe somebody has made something, you know, that that will fit in there and replace it. The oil pressure gauge is another item that never worked. And we replaced the sending unit twice. <laughs> and there's, there's plenty of oil pressure in the car. Uh, it's just not reading on the gauge. Now, there's a company in California called Momar, and that's M-O-M-A-R. I don't know where they're located. Maybe one of the Shelby American magazines will help you out there. They can fix the tack. The, the tack is a mystery. Don't, I have no idea why the tack is not working. Uh, they can fix the tack, and they can also fix the oil pressure gauge. But you must send them the sending unit for the oil pressure gauge. They would be your best bet. They are your only bet, as a matter of fact, because there isn't anybody else in the country that can fix that. So we kind of move up to 1982, where Matt and I get divorced. Nothing more is done on the Shelby. I turn around and I sell the car to, oh God, now what's his name? <laughs> Bill Murray. Actually, his brother Dave is the one that bought the car. But Bill Murray is one of the foremost experts on Culver's. And his brother bought the car. I needed the money pretty bad you know, for moving and getting out of the divorce. And what Dave did is he cleaned it up, got it running, and quickly turned around and made a two or $3,000 profit and sold it to a fellow down in Lakewood whose name is Kurt Worsham. Kurt Worsham is no longer living in Lakewood. He has since moved on to Phoenix or somewhere. I'm not in touch with him anymore. But the way you see the car now is credit to Kurt because he did all the detailing on the motor, he put the exhaust system on, and he had it painted. I didn't do any of that. The exhaust system is, is to Ford Specs. It's the way the car originally came. The dump tube that's in the back, or I shouldn't say dump tube, but the, the exhaust port is the original one for the car. They're very expensive. Uh, try not to crack it if you can help it because you probably will never find another one. The wheels that are on the car are the original Shelby wheels. They are not original for that car. I had the original ones on the car, but they were cracking and they were in very bad condition. So what Kurt did is he traded them in for the wheels that are there now. Of course, they're used, but they look beautiful, and they are the right ones. They're optional five-spoke Shelby wheels. He detailed the motor. No work at all needed to be done to the interior of the motor. Uh, you can thank Rob Henry for that. Now, Kurt, as he was detailing out the motor, did take the heads off to look inside. He said everything looks super. He sprayed the comp engine compartment. He put the correct Ford hoses on. He also replaced the carburetor. The carburetor is the right one for the car. Um, basically, he, he, did a, he did a real nice job. The only thing that he changed that I would not have is that I had some 8-millimeter Axel yellow jacket wires. And he went to those, uh, I think they're 7-millimeter, seven seven they're uh, whatever color they are. But the yellow ones looked a lot nicer. And since no mileage had been put on them, I just couldn't understand why he took them off. In any event, that was personal preference. He was more of a Shelby fanatic than I was, and he knew more of how to detail the car out than I did. So maybe he, he you know, did the car good. His wife, Arlene, cleaned the interior. Uh, it's all original. The upholstery was in, was in pretty good shape. Of course, the driver's seat takes more wear and tear than the other seats, and you will find some tears in it, but the back seat is absolutely immaculate. And that just leads me to believe that the original owner was a single guy, and he probably never even opened it up. Things that are in the interior, Bill, uh, for example, the radio was put in by Kurt. There must have been some Pioneer unit in there and the original owner took it out when he sold when he sold the car 
And um, so when I got it, there was no radio at all. But when Kurt bought the car from Dave Murray, he, um, he went out and saw the original A-Track unit. And it, supposedly it works, although I don't think that I ever hooked it up because I got too much static. You know, fiberglass just didn't ground real well. And, and so I just disconnected it. And probably if you hook it back up, it would work. But, you know, you'll have a lot of static. Kurt also put those uh, Goodyear high-speed, uh, you know, police tires on them. Personally, I don't like them. They look nice on the car, but I thought it made the car handle real squirrely. But, you know, who's going to complain about having, uh, you know, good tires? Oh, I guess I should say that after Kurt got the car all fixed up, I was in a better financial position, and, uh, you know, in the efforts to get the car back, I bought it back from him. And so I paid $8,800 buying the car back. When he had the car painted, he took it to a Ford dealer down in Denver. One of their painters had done a lot of work in the past for the Shelby Club. And he charged Kurt, I think, about $1,800 to have the car painted. Now, there was very minor body work that needed to be done. The only body work was where that tire had crumpled up the quarter panel. And I think the guy did a pretty good job of straightening that out because it does match very well. But see, all the cosmetic pieces, like the, the scoops and stuff, they were all there. I mean, the car was basically 95% complete, you know, when I sold it. So all he had to do was really strip it down and paint it. He, he did something, though, to the, I don't know what, to the trunk lid and also to the front and, of course, as you know, the bubbles keep coming up. Now, I had the bubbles come up twice, and so I sent the car off twice to have it repainted. And then finally, when I sold it again, you know, I told the kid, look, there's bubbles. It's being painted. You know, you're going to have to deal with that. And he bought it, and three days later, I get a phone call from, from this fellow, and he says, look, the bubbles are up again. And I said, well, I don't know what to tell you, but, you know, I told you that I was having that problem. And uh, it's not like you didn't know. This, this person that I sold it to, his name is Eric Easton. He lived in Evergreen, Colorado. He knows nothing about the car. And all he wanted to do was, was buy it for a song and dance and make a killing on it. And he was really hoping to buy the car for about $7,500 or $8,000. He knew all along that he was going to take it out to California where it would bring a real high price. And I guess that plan sort of backfired in his face because, <laughs> you know, for what you paid for the car, you know, you really stuck it to him good. So he actually lost more money on the car than I did, which I guess in my own little way I was really happy for because Eric gave me a very difficult time with the car. Some other things that come to mind, Bill, as I'm thinking here, uh, the U-joints in the car had been replaced. The speedometer cable was replaced, but I believe that there is a little gear, a white nylon gear, that goes into the transmission, and that gear will need to be changed. And that is probably why the speedometer is not, is not working. But that is something that you can take care of. I'm trying to think of other things that we replaced as far as uh, underneath goes. Uh, Oh, I know. One thing that always bothered me about the car, the taillights are supposed to blink in sequence, which they do, but they are not very bright. Now, word is that there is a, an electronic box, they call it a black box, which is in the trunk. And it's the same unit that they use in the T-Birds and in Cougars. And if you can go to a junkyard or if you know somebody who deals in electronics, give them the board and have them test the resistors. They'll probably have one or two that are bad or very weak. If those are replaced, then the lights should blink brighter. Now, Bill Murray, the fellow who is the culvert expert, told me that. So that might be something that you'd want to look into. But the, all the lights work on the car, or at least they did when, I, when it pulled out of here. I was really surprised when you told me that you had to replace the clutch. I just cannot believe that from Evergreen, Colorado to 
to San Jose that Eric managed to burn it out. I, I just can't believe it because there isn't that much mileage on the car. I, there shouldn't be, but two or 3,000 miles on that clutch. So that is very strange. But Eric was a real wild guy, and he, uh, he was bragging about driving it at 120 or 130 miles an hour. So I tell you, I'm really not surprised. There's one interesting point that comes to mind, and we're going to have to backtrack a little bit to when I was living in Boulder, and this would be about 1979. When, I, when the car first came into the state, all I had on it was an old registration, New York State, and I had a bill of sale from Rob Henry. Well, here's the car coming off the back of an 18-wheeler, and it's sitting up on a loading dock. Well, since it's new in the state, I have to have it inspected. So I have a Boulder County police officer come and look at the car, check all the paperwork, you know, just to go through the formality, making sure that the car is correct. So he looks at the VIN number on the dash, and he checks it with his pen to make sure that the rivets aren't loose. And then he checks the motor, and he doesn't see the numbers on the motor. And then he gives the car a good once over, and he realizes that the dash is black, the posts going up, the liner posts are white, he can't read the numbers on the motor, and he sees traces of red inside the driver's door. If you remove the driver's door panel, that the door, the inside of the door is red. I would only assume that the original owner must have had a boo-boo on the car and replaced the door. That's the best that I could figure out. So this police officer sees all this. And in addition, there is a typographical error on the VIN number on the bill of sale. Is something like, it's supposed to be 9FMO something or other, if I remember right. And I think it said 9SO and whatever the numbers were. Well, he says, I, I'm sorry. I, I can't accept this car. He says, I think it's stolen. So I said, you've got to be joking. He says, well, he says, I'm going to have to call a detective and get him down here to look at the car. In the meantime, don't go out of town. Don't take the car with you. You know, take it to your apartment and leave it there. So the next day, two detectives come out along with two police officers, and now they want to impound the car. Well, of course, I am absolutely livid because I'm saying, you know, you're not going to impound the car. I know what you guys want to do. If you, if you tear it apart, I'm going to get it back in a basket. Or, you know, some police officer is going to, you know, buy the car at auction for himself, and I'm going to be out 5000 bucks. So what they did is they said, fine, if you don't want us to impound it, then we have to check serial numbers, which means that you'll have to remove the fender. OK. I said, come back tomorrow when my husband is here, and we'll take the fender apart in the parking lot, which is what we eventually did. And within an hour, having two detectives and two police officers over our shoulders, we dismantled the driver's side front fender, checked the VIN numbers, and the VIN number is correct. And uh, so they left us alone. <laughs> but it sort of did us a favor, because we managed to take a look underneath the car and see exactly how rusted it was. And surprisingly enough, there wasn't any. I think just for good measure, if you're interested, or if you ever have the car redone, painted, whatever, have them take off the passenger side front fender and check. Because if there is any rust, you want to catch it now. You don't want to have a, that removed later on. But the car is exceptionally clean, you know, considering that it had a history, you know, originally on the East Coast. You know, I guess I would say that I sort of rescued it and brought it out here to a drier climate. And, uh, you know, it, it did get pretty good treatment. It didn't stay outside very long. Actually, it sat in the garage for about three, about three years. So it really hasn't been out, you know, exposed that badly. I have to tell you that I'm really getting a charge out of going back through all this in my mind because it seems like it's been so long since I've remembered, you know, how I got the car and all the problems that I went through. 
uh, I'm sort of sitting here and chuckling over it. It's, uh, it's quite interesting for me. One thing that I also discovered as I drove the Shelby around town, and of course this is after I had bought it from Kurt, and you know, once I bought it from Kurt, I really didn't have to do anything to it. The car was, was complete, it was, it was roadworthy, and, and it just looks super. It is just the meanest looking car in, in town. And when I would take it out and drive it down the street, every head that saw it turned, every single one. And the most spectacular thing about the Shelby is the sound. There is no other car and will never be any other car that will sound like a Shelby. They have their own throaty sound. It's the muffler system and the, I don't know how they do it, but you know, it's just like some people hear certain motorcycles and they go, oh gee, that's a Honda or that's a Cowie. You know, if I hear a Shelby, I always know it. I just know it. It's in your blood and it's something that you can't get out of it. Once you've had a Shelby, you, you've had the taste of it, you've had a taste of a muscle car, and you just can't go back to anything else. Sometimes I question myself and I say, Mark, you know, did you do the right thing in selling the car? You know, because this is something that you worked really hard for and long for and basically got divorced over. And, uh, you know, was it, was it worth it? Well, yeah, it was worth it. There aren't too many people that can say that they've ever owned a Shelby. To be exact, there's only been 1,085 that have ever owned a 69. Uh, and, you know, I'm one of the lucky ones to, to still have had one, you know, 13 to 15 years later. And uh, it, it's just been an, it's been an honor, just an honor to have a car like that. From the time that I first started getting interested in the Shelby, which was, you know, back in 1977 when I purchased the car, more and more companies have popped up all over the place, I mean, all over the country. If you subscribe to Shelby American, you will find that there are dozens of, of companies that are all over, and the majority of them seem to be on the, on the West Coast, you know, being California. So you have more things available to you now than I did when I was first working on the car. And, you know, Things like, uh, you know, getting rubber parts, you know, seals for the windows and, you know, and that sort of thing. The glass in the car is, is the original glass. The, the scratches that are on the rear, the rear window were from a tree limb that had fallen. This, again, was what, what Robert Henry had told me. Uh, a tree limb fell on the car and scratched it. The, the two holes that are in the front window, I have no idea. When I purchased the car, they were there. Maybe that's why James Campbell had put uh, decal bullseye or bullet holes on the glass or something or other. But none of those glasses have been replaced. So, um, you know, that would be something to try to hang on to. I understand that back window is very, very expensive. I wouldn't even begin to speculate as to how much it would cost to replace. And, you know, with the rubber being so old, you probably would never get it to seal up again anyway. Well... I tell you, I keep taking pauses here in between my thoughts, and I think that I've, I think I've covered just about everything. Basically, you've got the story on the car, you know, and how it, how I got it, and you know, certain things that I've put into it, and all. Um, I, gee, I, I hope that I helped you out. You know, if you have any questions, I guess you could always call me. And uh, what I'll do before I send this this tape out is I'll hunt around the house because I think I've got some old bills and receipts, you know, for the car, parts and whatnot. And, you know, I don't need them anymore, so I'll just send them on out to you. Um, send me a photo. I'd love to see the car, you know, to see if it still looks as good as when it left here. And, um, you know, just have a long and prosperous life with it. And uh, I hope that you've enjoyed it as much as, you know, as I have. You know, it's certainly a classic. It's one of a kind. There aren't too many left. So uh, take good care of it. And uh, thanks for being patient with me. Appreciate it.